And it's Jay Stane. Welcome back to In Retrospect Podcast, where we look beyond the surface to find understanding. Bring you laughs, knowledge, and culture. So sit back, relax, and join the convo. Today, we are joined by two very special guests. We have Miss Kiafa Forsyth, who is a speech language pathologist, and Miss Lakeisha Wilkins, who is a school psychologist. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ladies, for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Not the round of my flat. Uh, <laughs> round of applause. Round of applause. <laughs> so we're going to kick it off with our segment called Let's Unpack This, where you guys send in your questions or we cover something that is happening in the news. Today we have a lovely letter um, that is centered around what we'll talk about today. So I'm going to go ahead and read that and I want your genuine reaction. Okay. So it says, what's up, y'all? So I need to know if I'm overthinking the situation or if I need to address it with my supervisor. Each month, our staff hold a themed dinner to build morale. This past month was holiday themed and the group decided to play a game of White Elephant. Everyone was responsible for purchasing a gift to be exchanged at the end of dinner. Dinner was subpar, drinks were on point, but the night was going great. Well until the exchanging of the gifts. So all the gifts are, where is it at? Anonymous. Each person chooses a gift based on which number they've been assigned. Mm -hmm. People were getting gift cards, wine, wireless speakers, nice things. Then one of my coworkers opens a gift that was a bottle of Apple Crown and lottery scratch off. Multiple people immediately turned around and looked at me. Two went as far as to say, I know Tyshawn bought these. Tyshawn, that's hilarious. Scratch-offs? Really? It was at this moment. I tuned out the remainder of the party and was pissed. Now I can't stop thinking about it and really want to address it. It's not the first microaggression I've experienced here as the only Black person. I don't want to be on an island alone. I will be tuning in to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any initial reactions? Wow. Yeah. Um, that is a lot to unpack. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess for me, sometimes as an educator, I tend to opt out of things like that <laughs> because it can always lead to an awkward moment. Um, I don't know. And he's the only person of color in his workplace. Only black person. But the name, he, the name is probably, is what, yeah. What? <laughs> oh, hi, Sean. I, yeah, yeah. I, like, people mm -hmm. automatically think, oh, yeah, you know, uh, Isha, uh, Alpha, mm -hmm. like those are, you know, anything <laughs> A's or Isha, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. just assume or like, you know, even Justin, they assume that you're um, a certain ethnicity based off your name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unless they read that middle name. Right. Well, then, right. I mean, I've been <laughs> uh, <laughs> I went to a summer program in Henry <laughs> and it was like we were having a kind of a discussion about, I don't know how we got on hair, but it was like, so when you spray Afro okay. sheen, is it really like you're supposed to have an Afro or like, what does that do to your hair? And it's like, what? Like, of course it was a mixed group at Emory, um, yeah. Emory University, but I was like in 11th grade when I went to this summer program. Oh, mm -hmm. So it was a right. diverse group, just like the school is, mm -hmm. but- it was just interesting the questions that were raised to the blacks. You know, it was only a few of yeah. us. It was like, okay, well, y'all speak for everybody. What is Afro Sheen? Like, what is that? It was like, so, <laughs> right? Wow. It was like, okay, so do you correct them? Mm -hmm. You know, so they won't get out in the world and be mm -hmm. embarrassed. Aren't they embarrassed? Like, they felt comfortable enough to ask you, so they couldn't have been too embarrassed. Like, 
I don't know how you would do that. I, I don't think I would have just ignored the rest of I wouldn't have tuned out the rest of the party. I probably would have had something slick to say, like oh, in the moment. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. if I I'm thinking, processing it, my response is probably gonna be worse than if I would have addressed it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the total opposite. I would have yeah. kind of shut down and would have got in my head about everything like leading up to that and everything after that. Um, and I kind of had a similar experience to Kiki with, you know, white people asking about my hair or I had one of my friends who was like, I showed up late. She was like, girl, you on CP time. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> a non-black person said that? Yes. Yes. No, ma'am. So I didn't address it at the time because we were in a crowd. But later on, I was like, hey, like, um, you can't, you're not allowed to say CP time. And she's like, well, you know, I've said it before. And I'm like, listen, I'm trying to save you from like getting a beat down out in the community. Yeah. Right. There are certain things you can't say because you're white. And the fact that I guess she was just real comfortable in using it, she didn't stutter or anything, just kind of, you know, it took me back. Um, and our relationship right now is just like we kind of parted ways since then. And I just I started to distance myself because if you're comfortable saying CP time, what else are you saying when I'm not around? Mm -hmm. Right. All kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All kind of things. Yeah. Let the imagination run wild. Anything is possible. Anything under the sun could be being said. Mm -hmm. um, I will also say, too, don't get me wrong. I like crown. Scratch offs are nice from time to time, <laughs> but you know, just because don't mean you can look at. Don't shake your head. Don't do that. They you might just put on Hennessy in there. <laughs> <laughs> but I, like <laughs> and I don't even like Hennessy. I ain't gonna lie. I don't, Me I don't either. Like Nor do I like I Crown. Mean, it's nasty. I, I, myself I, as a no, shot. I do like that. Crown. Go ahead. I mean, you got to get the regular one. You don't want the sweet because you don't. Have, anyway, let me stay on top. <laughs> 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 anyway, but all I wanted to say was was that. It's interesting that, you know, this continues to happen in different, you know, settings. Uh, it can be the same be said, like, for instance, if you're on the phone with somebody, uh, say for either you're doing like a phone interview per se, you show up in person and then they're like, oh, this voice uh, does not match what I expected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, or it can be as simple as, um, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced um, being pulled over before in a car. Uh, oh, your yeah. car may be kind of nice. And then all of a sudden you down the window and they're like, ooh. <laughs> well, right. <I> that. <laughs> and it's just interesting in these uh work settings i would say for this particular instance that they assume that said person was the one who brought these cr the crown and these lottery tickets like they don't partake in this stuff as well and when right. i say they other ethnicities white people asians anybody under the whole umbrella of ethnicities that yeah. can partake because you'd be surprised a lot of people may assume like oh Blacks are in there playing lottery real hard, scratch offs really hard. Well, right. you might want to look to the left because you're going to see a bunch of other ethnicities mm -hmm. right beside the black folk doing the same thing. And I say all that to say this, it's just very disheartening too because we are we are told that we're moving in a better direction mm -hmm. uh, with workplace, uh, how do I say, feeling safer in the workplace, more comfortable mm -hmm. in the workplace. We're supposed to be a team. And some organizations like to say family but um yeah it's kind of interesting that with this situation in particular that they're mm -hmm. singling him out as the one who brought that into um, the party. Yeah. i was going to say i'm more I'm really like, like on the floor. Floor. where if something happens i need time to process mm -hmm. and then come to the table and talk about it i can't ignore it because i don't have a good poker face if I'm pissed off, you know I'm pissed off. <laughs> there's, no guess, there's no guessing about it. Um, and I've experienced this in a different way. So I've had another Black person who's older than me say, well, I'm not going to say when or whatever, but they said that I was a white woman in a Black woman's body. And I, my response was, well, I must be Rachel Dolezal because... <laughs> The shirts that I wear to work are very like black Afro centric. I have locks. It just didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So I'm to say, if I were in Tyshawn's shoes, you have every right to feel pissed off. And I personally would address it with mm -hmm. my supervisor because there may be other people of color that come into your workspace and mm -hmm. you don't want those people to experience 
similar or worse microaggressions or just flat out racism. Yeah. Yeah. I think and I just wanted to close on this. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to close on this real quick as well when we wrap this up. Uh is that everybody is different. So I know everybody's heard everybody chime in on this. Uh you might be different. You have some people that are gonna snap back. Uh you have some people that are just gonna be like, all right, I'm cool on that. I'm just don't want to stop messing with you. I don't want to talk to you, but it also mm -hmm. depends on the person. I would just mm -hmm. encourage anybody that is in this situation to try to correct them immediately because if you don't, it will continue to fester and become more and more of an issue down the road for you or somebody else. Because the first thing they will say if you let it fester is, oh, so-and-so didn't say it was a problem. And it was a problem. So if it does bother you, address it. Uh, me personally, I'm probably going to address it. Um, I'm told I'm a little aggressive at times, but that's fine. It's cool mm -hmm. to be respectful. And I can be respectful back to you as simple as that. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> what were you about to say? Uh, oh, I was going to say something along the lines of what you said about um, talking to your supervisor about it. And if it's still not being addressed, then maybe that's not the workplace for you. Yeah, that's true. What if it's your supervisor that has the microaggressions? Mm. Oh, it's definitely yeah. not the yeah. place for you. <laughs> it's like, who Dude, are you HR, going to? HR got a number. Yeah. Yeah. Take this little trip. <laughs> I but I also would say be careful too, though, because HR sometimes in some workplaces, HR and your managers and supervisors that may be giving you trouble are buddy buddy or are in tandem and work together. So yeah. at that point, if nothing is working out for you, you need to find somewhere. Me personally, I would find somewhere else to work. Right. And of work. course, if you come out of character, then you're considered aggressive, or it's oh, Crazy. you know, oh my god, <laughs> like why did you? I, I don't know where this is coming from. Exactly. Um, I was going to say one of my first jobs straight out of school was in Knoxville, Tennessee, which is no, <laughs> not very it. diverse. No, it. yeah, it's, it's not very diverse. It is very white. Um, I was one of the only people of color, period, not mm -hmm. just black, but one of the only people of color, period, and experienced a lot of racism. Not necessarily in my workplace, but with the clients that we work with mm -hmm. and being in social work and mental health, that can be tricky because you're trying to provide a service to someone that does not respect you yeah. or does not like you based on how you look. And that's not something that I necessarily prepared for coming out of grad school. So I wanted to see from y'all or ask y'all as a young adult, is the workplace what you thought it would be? Absolutely not. No. I second that. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I thought for me working in the school sector, so like Daisha, like I worked in South Carolina where it was predominantly white. Um, and I was one of the first psychologists um, in Spartanburg County. So, um, it was very hard just kind of getting my foot in the door and proving that I belong there. Mm -hmm. um, but I find that also in cultures where it's a bunch of minorities, like in schools where all the kids are black and brown, it's I'm finding the same dynamic. It's almost like it's so we tend to get wrapped up in the social hey girl, hey aspect and not the professionalism. Um, and then if you're seen as more professional than hey girl, hey then you come off as a bitch or is, mm -hmm. oh my God, this person is stuck up or what's wrong with her? Like, what's her issue? Um, and, you know, I'm always there. These people are my coworkers. I'm there to get a paycheck. That's all there is to it. Um, I have some friendships at work that I definitely honor and hold on to. But, um, you know, I have a life outside of work. So mm -hmm. I... I try not to put too much stock in what goes on. Um, I thought it was going to be more so kumbaya and just, you know, us holding hands and singing a song and being there for kids, which is very like, you know, not, you know, what it was at all. And it's still not. No. <laughs> yeah. Totally agree. Like when I was in grad school, um, Several of my professors were black. So they did speak a lot about you will be judged because ma the majority of SLPs are white. It's, you know, mostly dominated by 
um, Caucasians. And she would, uh, one of my professors, Dr. Dwight, would always say, they're always going to say something about what you have on, you know, about being cute. It's never about, you know, the job that you're doing, you know, and end up working with some of your classmates that you might have done better than in a lot of the areas. I wasn't expecting to have that same experience at a predominantly black school. Like mm -hmm. when I first started, when I worked in North County, which was predominantly white, mm -hmm. you couldn't talk like you would say one thing small to a student and they would go home and tell their parents. And it's like, I didn't say anything wrong, but then you get to schools that are predominantly black and you get some of the parents that think they can just befriend you, you know, mm -hmm. talk to you in a different way, or even co-workers that act more like their children than the, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, than the actual yeah. children. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I, I just didn't think I would be in middle school because I worked at a middle school. Like, that's what it, it feels <laughs> like sometimes. <laughs> like, um, so I, I definitely agree. I did not think the work culture would be like it is as an adult, mm -hmm. like this is really yeah. what grown people do. Like I, yeah. I don't, I don't get it. And then the other yeah. thing is like you can take all the grad school courses in the world. No one, this is not in a textbook anywhere. No. Mm hmm. No. Yeah, I find it funny though how everybody's always screaming, "I'm grown. I know what I'm doing." This, that, and the third. But then when you get in these workplace environments, it's like. Um, you're acting like a child, but even the child is behaving better than yourself. Right. Uh, children throw tantrums, but there's usually a reason. And mm -hmm. they can't tell you why they're throwing the tantrum uh, nine times out of ten because they're still trying to figure out their emotions and how to decipher all that. As yeah. an adult, we would, I guess as children growing up, we assume that adults had it together. And then when we mm -hmm. got into the workforce, it was like, uh, this, this is not what I thought. Uh, <laughs> I'm starting to realize that everybody was not raised the same. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a couple other things. This is like, I live life a certain way, and I can tell a lot of you here don't do that. <laughs> yeah. And it um, shows. <laughs> and I think, so I'm trying to think. So where me and Justin met, where we used to work, I feel like they felt or they wanted it to feel like a family almost. And so, and for the most part, it did. I mean, it, it, we had drama and things like that, but it, for the most part, everybody was close. People, <laughs> people really hung out at each that. other's uh, <laughs> homes and were around each other's families and all that sort of thing. So when I left Charleston and traveled to Tennessee, and I've already explained how that <laughs> was, when I came to Atlanta, I literally thought, oh, this is Wakanda. That like everybody, <laughs> everybody is like loving on each other, and it's just black excellence, whatever that means to you. And I mean, there's that exists, mm -hmm. but I feel like within that there is a culture in Atlanta that I am learning is like a mean girl syndrome, mm -hmm. where people are just competitive with you from hello, yeah, and. They don't, they aren't befriending you in a genuine, not everybody, but they're not befriending you in a genu genuine sense. It's more of like, what can I get out of you? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's being in a bigger city. I don't know what that is. Yeah. But that piece of it, I was not prepared for as a young adult in college going into the workforce. It just feels like high school. Yeah. <laughs> All over again. It feels now. And, you know, <laughs> and, and at the core of it, it should be like the Black Wakanda. It, but I think that like growing up in New York, I feel like people are, you know, either you like me or you hate me. If you hate me, you're not going to talk to me. Mm -hmm. I feel Man, like you're like, different now. Yeah. In the South, it's kind of <laughs> like you will talk to each other and then stab each other in the back and then smile and turn the knife and smile some more. Nice, nasty. Like, <laughs> and then, you know, of course, everybody wants to run down their resume when you meet them. Hey, I do this. I model. I rap. I sing. I bartend. And it's like, I just wanted to know your name and just that was it. <laughs> and organically get to that. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, you have the people here who are like, you know, have these million dollar homes with no furniture in it. Like, everybody's mm -hmm. doing it for the culture. And it's like, I'm, 
I'm just a regular person. I live in a three, two drive a modest little Honda. Like I'm not putting on for anybody. I'm so sorry. Atlanta has not always been like that. I mean, I grew up here and you might hear people say, you know, old Atlanta, Atlanta was not always imposter syndrome. Uh, Atlanta is really a lot of imposter syndrome going on. It did not always, it wasn't always like that. It was very hospitable, you know, in the 80s, 90s. You know, think about you know, Freaknik being here. You had to be hospitable for, you know, people to just come have a camaraderie just out in the streets dancing or parking your car, talking to people, you know, any and everybody. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't mm-hmm. always based off of, you know, looks, I definitely agree. Now it's a lot of, um, a lot of what do you have? What are you driving? Mm -hmm. What designer are you wearing? As opposed to getting to know someone for who they are, you got to have a certain aesthetic, Mm -hmm. you know, even though a lot of people say, oh, you know, we want this, but this is who you typically socialize with, which is opposite of what you're saying. Or along those lines, who you know. Oh, so people love to name drop. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because name dropping in Atlanta, like you can go anywhere and see a celebrity yeah. anywhere and be like, oh, that's such and such, and just keep walking yeah. because it's so commonplace. But mm-hmm. people who don't grow up yeah. here and you see somebody and it's like, oh well, yeah, I saw such and such, and we did it, you know, and it's like, like you said, the name dropping. Mm-hmm. I don't know when the change happened. Maybe more so when people started coming here to, you know, more of the so-so death. And then you had a lot of the actors and stuff coming here. When it's more movie pro- um, producing here. Maybe that's when it changed. And but, probably the Atlanta Housewives, too, had something to do with that. Oh, oh yeah. Being on TV. <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. And I also think it could be, um, it could be multiple things. But also social media. Like, Mm-hmm. We're very accessible to one another and people love to flex on social media about what they have or how their life is going when it's really not what it seems. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've all talked about how we've dealt with some some spicy people <laughs> at work. <laughs> not spicy. <laughs> yeah, spicy. Spicy or salty. Um, I like so- crunchy. Oh, yeah, crunchy too. <laughs> <laughs> so like... Can y'all talk about an experience that you've had where you learned, okay, I need to start setting professional boundaries. I didn't even know that this was a thing, but now I know. And I'm going to do it. Um, I think for me, it was when um, some people had hosted like a birthday thing where they do every month uh, in August. So I was in that first round. Mm-hmm. And so they had like a cake and ordered like wings or whatever. So I go in the teacher's lounge and we're kind of talking and they started talking about work. And they, and one person was like, yeah, you know, um, the student's name, it was a male student, was just, yeah, switching down the hallway like he was a female. OK, so I'm going to I'm going to put this out here. I'm a person of color and I'm also a queer person of color. Mm-hmm. So what I find in that scenario is that even though you're trying to build this camaraderie, there's still this division. Mm -hmm. So, and if you're using that type of language, I'm going to separate myself because you don't know who's gay. You don't know who's straight. You don't know who's trans, bi, whatever, but you just automatically assuming that, you know, once again, with that, Hey girl, Hey culture, and just us, you know, having to do all this stuff together. um, It just, yeah, it just wasn't for me. And then afterwards the person was like, Hey, you know, do you not want to do this anymore? And I was like, no, I'm just going to opt out. And I think that since then, um, it's been like she refused to speak to me, will not acknowledge my presence unless um, she needs something from me. And I'm totally fine with it. That is so unfortunate. I'm sorry that happened. I wasn't there at that point, right? No, that was my first month in Fulton. Oh, what a welcome. (laughs) Touch down. (laughs) <laughs> so I was like, okay. So then I kind of just kind of backed off from all things social at work and just kind of just sat back and watched to see, you know, who kind of moved with who and how things, how the culture was. Um, and yeah, I'd maybe only talk to maybe one or two people at work and that was it. Yeah. So Justin. 
Uh, yeah, Justin. A work right. experience so, uh, with a professional boundary? Because I knew you needed a oh, reminder. <laughs> me? Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, if you want to talk about that instance we had when we were working together. About, go ahead. <laughs> no, nah, because we, we were real close or whatnot, and we were talking about everybody can come to, like, everybody's house and do this, that, and the third to build that team camaraderie or whatnot. But it comes to a point when it's just like, I'm going to need y'all to leave so I can reset for the next day. And y'all getting a little too comfortable and starting to blur the lines. So now at this point, I got to let y'all know, like, we could be cool outside of work, but now I'm going to have to start to become more professional in the sense that once work is over on certain days, I'm going to need y'all to stay where y'all at Mm -hmm. and I can see y'all later or whatnot, but we got to keep what's going on outside of work and what's going on at work at work uh, because it started to also become a thing where what would happen outside of work was being discussed at work Um. and in front of everybody. (laughs) So you know... They got them ears and antennas on. So all of a sudden, things are carrying to parents, people walking around, talking about situations. So it's just one of those things. You just got to be mindful of. But Daisha, would you like to add some context? Yeah, I was going to say, but to be fair, that was set before you and I were ever working there. As far as we we culture, that's the culture we yes, like as far (laughs) as supervisors blurring the lines between Mm -hmm. supervisor and employee, because that's why you have things like the Lizzle thing, the Lizzle. uh, I'm pretty sure that was a situation where the lines were blurred. Mm -hmm. I work for you, but we're friends, so we could go party, things happen, and now I'm uncomfortable. And now she called them fat. What do you mean? (laughs) <laughs> he also took them to clubs and everything, yeah, right? Yeah. Bananas out the cooch. That's too far. That's and too it's like them big. I'm trying to understand. <laughs> she didn't call them big. <laughs> He's stuck on the big <laughs> part. He's stuck on the fat part. Right. <laughs> That's, her That's her whole brand. Why would she call them big? I don't know. That's what anyway, I'm Anyway, I watched the show. It was very endearing. <laughs> Moving on from Lizzo, I'm just saying, like, that is an extreme example of how when you blur the lines as far as, like, you know, supervisors and employees, how that can go left real quick. Yeah. The handful of people that I know from work that I've become work friends with that I've seen outside of and know, like, a lot of my life is. I can count on my hand. I don't have a lot of, I don't deal with a lot of people outside of work simply because of what y'all said, you know. Um, so I don't think I've had to set a boundary. One experience that I had and learned, which was kind of, it hurt my feelings. I'm not even going to lie. I am a sensitive person. Don't look at me like that. So I had a situation <laughs> where, I, heard, I, think I don't I know, she, is she talking to you or me? I was talking to Justin because he made me. I had a situation where I was becoming very close with the um, co-worker and people at each other on social media, things like that. And they became upset because I liked to post on their partner's page and it blew up from a like from a like. It just blew up into something more. Um, and they started to include other co-workers into it. And so at that point, um, it kind of deterred me from even wanting to form deeper connections with people that I work with, because I've never experienced something like that before. The people who I have as friends now, I've had for five plus years. Mm-hmm. I have friends still from elementary school. I'm not used to dealing with conflict with a friend and then we never resolve it. And it's like, we don't speak. I'm not used to that. Um, so when it comes to that now, when I go to like meetings and I have to see this person, I just opt out of being near them or having to work with them. <laughs> Unless we absolutely um, have to, then of course we're going to be professional. Uh, but I just had to do it like that because... I'm not going to allow somebody to, you know, bring me out of my character. This is my job at the end of the day. And we grown, as we like to say, so. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. At, that, at our big age, right? Yeah. At this <laughs> big age, you should be able to have resolution <laughs> skills, but not everyone does. 
You so, know, like my like my grandparents say all the time, you know, common sense ain't common. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> so don't lie to yourself assuming that everybody has common sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think it goes back to that mean girl culture thing that mm-hmm. you talked about. And she seems like just part of that culture of okay, I don't like you, so I'm gonna get everybody else not to like you. And yeah. it's like I guess whoever is in her mean girl click, I'm like, you can't think for yourself. Like you that down, you about to jump something. You know what I'm saying? Like, get, really? Yeah. Like, when did that happen? I don't, I, when did the whole mean girl thing at work started happening? I, I just don't understand. When, when I feel like I experienced it more since moving to Atlanta. I'm not even going to lie to you. Like mm-hmm. I, and this again, I don't know because I'm not from here. Back home, of course, there were people who didn't get along at work. Mm-hmm. I just didn't pay them any mind. And yeah. I and I got into it with one person <laughs> at work back then. Um, but like the following day, again, I don't have a poker face. Mm-hmm. If I'm pissed off with you, you know it. It's not a secret. She tried to speak to me and say something like, hey, girl, hey, type thing. And I was like, oh, we're speaking? Because I need to like... I need to have a conversation to move on. I can't act as if nothing happened. Nothing happened. That's not yeah. how I operate. Mm-hmm. And so we had a conversation and we moved on and we're cool. But mm-hmm. for some reason here, it's like you can think that you had a conversation and everything is fine. But later on down the line, you find out, oh, this person has been playing a game of telephone. Mm-hmm. And now, you know, everyone in the office knows what's going on and they're just kind of waiting for something mm-hmm. to pop off. I don't know <laughs> what that is. And I guess for me, it goes back to, and I'm thinking about it from like a psych lens. So uh, behavior is shaped through reinforcement and punishment, right? So clearly this person is getting reinforced for their behavior. So they're getting attention. They're getting something for, <laughs> you know, acting in this manner. And I guess that's, that's their norm and that's what they're used to because that's no it. one's ever like, Hey, you know, this behavior is not going to be tolerated. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't know how long she's been with the district, but I think that there's way too much camaraderie and the lines get very blurred the the higher you get up on the food chain. Yeah. Now, do we think that that's a culture, that's a a symptom of race, age, or gender? This whole like camaraderie versus- All of them. (laughs) uh, (laughs) Professional. Every level. Every last one of them, age, race, and gender. Because mm-hmm. race, one, number one, because unfortunately, the reality that everybody needs to accept but doesn't accept is some people are more comfortable talking to folks that are the same color as them. Mm-hmm. And that's just the nature of the situation. I feel that everyone that's on here now can relate more to me because in some form or fashion, we were raised in the same way. At some point or another, certain lines are starting to going to match up and be parallel in some form or fashion. Mm-hmm. Now, I will say gender uh, from the aspect of the same thing. Like, for instance, some males feel as if the other males will be able to relate to them better. And some women in workplaces feel like other women will be able to relate to them better because they'll be dealing with the same thing on a day to day basis. And that's just, you know, the reality of it. And it's, it's true. And when it comes to the age thing, as far as like, I'm pretty sure at some point or another, we've all been on a job and someone's probably been there for a long time and they're a supervisor or over us Mm -hmm. and it's their way or it's nothing. Like you can leave. And (laughs) when it comes to that, it's usually their way. And then they got a little friend or two here or there and they all been there around there about the same time. And they're like, yo, this is our whole area. This is us. Mm-hmm. What do you mean this is us? We're new, or I just I've been here for a couple of years now. Like, relax. Mm-hmm. You're my coworker. You're not like over me. Yeah. <laughs> You've seen more, but respect me. Mm-hmm. I'm grown. <laughs> and I think um um Jason, not to give you our experience, but right. the whole older women thinking they're over you, like mm-hmm. yeah, like <laughs> Like you said, we're all grown here. I don't know when you became my mother because of your age thing. Like you can't tell me what to do. But but I put that back on them though. So because they tell because I am reminded so often 
how I am the baby and I'm young and whatever. I like to throw their words back at them. You're correct. You are older than me. You are old enough to be my mother. Some of them, my grandparents. And I should not be the one. <laughs> I should not be the one who come to you and say, hey, this is not okay. This is not professional. Please have some type of decorum. Remember, you're older than me. I'm the baby. I'm just letting you know. And I just leave it at that. Do you think part mm -hmm. of cultural bias with ageism, sexism, mm -hmm. you know, has to do with um, our upbringing? Like, okay, that's your elder. You shouldn't mm -hmm. question what they mm -hmm. say or we shouldn't be free thinkers, like not even free thinkers, but allowed to make decisions on, oh, it's just because I said so, but mm -hmm. it's not logical. Mm -hmm. Like all yeah. that comes into play especially when you know when everybody is kind of culturally the same it's mm -hmm. not too many um not too many others at our you know at right. the workplace mm -hmm. we have a few like this year i think we have a little bit more but in the past it's maybe been one or two caucasians like now we have you know an indian person i think a couple of indian people but mm -hmm. i think those outside how we were raised cultural things kind of overflow into the workplace so they don't know how to really respect you because you're younger and it's like oh well she young she don't really know you know like first of all, you don't even do my job like we <laughs> we're not even, we don't even have the same job so how are you going to tell me if i know or not because i'm young when we don't even have the same job title you don't do what i do i can't you know? win but I, I think it's like, it's like, it doesn't, none of this matters. You're young and you need to do it this way. I don't know what you need to do, but you need to do it this way. <laughs> right. And yeah. you need to wear this and don't look like that. And when we all do this, you need to follow right along. And it's like, no. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And I, I agree. I think it is a whole, especially a Southern thing of like, <clears throat> respect your elders. Mm -hmm. However, I grew up with very, um, interesting grandparents <laughs> so uh i learned very young like respect is a two-way street mm -hmm. so and that's not to say that i'm going to be nice nasty to you but also like i'm not going to kiss your ass right. <laughs> I, I just i'm not so yes i will respect them but i will also tell them up front hey i hear you this is what i'm going to do Mm -hmm. So that we just on the same page and you're not surprised because Justin, I don't think you know about this, but there's we have a parking wars at our school. <laughs> and and, what? and okay, Jason on, started it. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> what do you mean? Hold on. So everybody got say this assigned parking is what you about to tell me? There isn't no assigned oh. parking. There is, yeah. but there isn't. So there are people who have self-assigned parking spots. And oh, there is a there's a row that says reserved, and then there's a most of the row says visitors, and then principal, teacher of the month, employee of the month. Mm -hmm. Anyway, no principal because he don't have a spot. Oh well, yeah, he doesn't even park there. He but parked like, in the loading dock. When I first started at this particular school, um, I was told, hey, you know, we park up um, up front. You can park in the reserve or visitors, whatever. And that's what I continue to do. I just park wherever it's open because that's what you do in a parking lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One morning, I get there. It's pouring down raining. So I see a spot. I pull in as one would do. I go into my office. I, I'm eating my oatmeal. I'm in a good mood because it's going to be a good first week of school. Don't you know I get a call to my office? Um, excuse me. <clears throat> Where are you parked? Um, in the front row. Where? In the front row on the left side? I don't know. Where is this going? Are you parked next to such and such? I don't know. What kind of car does that person drive? That doesn't even matter. You're parked in my spot. I said, oh, okay. I just thought I would let you know. Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> and I hung up. And... I yeah, was right. you can see if I go out there. Listen, all right. <laughs> I was pissed off, and the following day, I went to one of those people's offices, and I said, "Listen, I've told y'all this last semester, okay? If there's a spot 
that is available, I'm going to park. If you have a cone, I'm going to park my car, throw your cone and park. <laughs> if it is raining and your spot is available, guess what? I'm a park. I said that last semester and because I see it and I'm smiling and I got dimples, they're like, oh, she's not going to do that. But then when I do it, they are like enraged. They can't even believe I have the audacity. Um, and so now fast forward, we have all been directed that no one can park <laughs> up there um, or we will be told. And this is Dang. all because of what? People feel like I'm older, I'm more seasoned, I've been here, I've earned the best spot in the lot. It's it really is. stupid. I'm gonna be honest. Like <laughs> it is. There are so many things at this school we really could be addressing. And y'all want to talk about a parking space? I wish I would come out there and y'all tow my car over a parking space. We're gonna have a problem. That's going to be a problem. Like, I'm going to I'm going to human resources because yeah. <laughs> you're towing my car <laughs> over a parking space. Like, how old are we? That's like, don't sit in my seat. That's not your seat. Your name is not on it. Like, it's not your parking space. Your name is not on it. But the fact that that person was comfortable enough to call you and say that, and it did not come from an administrator. Right. But they're not going to do nothing because they are. Yeah, you better than me. I ought to park in their space every chance I got. Just to see where they got comfortable oh. at. Oh, oh they'll block you in. They yeah, <laughs> block you in. They have blocked people in for pulling into their space. Like, yeah, literally. I would have called the tow people. Somebody in front of my car. I don't know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> Come pick and it that's up. That's what I said. Um, I told Kiki I would just take an Uber home and leave my car. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got that same like, spot tomorrow. Yep. You have to really, like... You have to really not like your life to be worried about a parking space. Okay. Right? Okay. But you know what? Like, okay, I'm going to come from a psych lens again. It could yeah. be an act of control. So mm -hmm. it's in, in their own personal life, they may not have control of something going yeah. on. So they exert that control at work. Mm -hmm. In the parking space. Mm -hmm. And it's something that they can control and they know that they, no one's going to say anything versus them right. like, you know, doing something else that exerts more control. But I mean, it's the, it's the not anybody saying anything for me. Mm -hmm. Like, y'all really condoning this. Mm -hmm. Like, but I think it goes yeah. back to that hey girl, hey work culture. culture. Yeah. Of it's better to have, you know, that family camaraderie atmosphere than us to get the work done and be professional. So, how, <clears throat> so, because I don't want to end this on like a venting note. <laughs> but it didn't feel good to set it free. How do we navigate this type of culture? Because it exists and there's nothing that we can do alone to fix it. But mm -hmm. we still have to work because we still got bills that have to be paid. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is it that we can do so that it's peaceful for us at our workplaces? I think for me, I always keep in the back of my mind that throughout every experience that I've had at this particular school with these particular people, I have a lot going on outside of work way much more. And it's almost like I feel almost sad for them that this is this is their whole livelihood. Mm -hmm. All they got. This is all they all have. They got. So I just look at it like, oh, like this is OK. This is this is all that they have. Amazing. Yeah. So it's almost like a I give them plenty of grace. That's very kind of you. But I also see a therapist like twice a month. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but um, you know, cuz like you said it's not going to change. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes if it gets to be too much, actually leaving that particular work environment cuz sometimes mm -hmm. it can get that, you know, that toxic. Mm -hmm. Um, but also, I think it's important to have, you know, someone that you can vent to and talk to about it in a safe space. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I think I just have to ignore them. Because I, I know, like you said, my face will probably show it. And I'm just like, I think I was blocked in one time and I went to that person. I'm like, well, give me your keys because I need to go get something to eat since you don't block me in. Like, Yeah, let me use your gas. Yeah, like, <laughs> give me your keys. And she gave them to me. I'm like, I mean, because I... You're not going to move your car. 
because you ain't finna go nowhere. So yeah, let me go on and get the keys, and I'll I'll be back. So yeah, I, I yeah, I would say be the change you want to see. Uh, from the perspective of if you know a lot is like, huh? I said okay, Gandhi. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I could say that, but you know, I'd be acting different in situations, but you know, I'd be trying to promote the correct way to go about things. But be the change you want to be. And what I mean by that is, you know, try to handle situations to the best of your ability with grace. Yes, we do understand that everybody has different mannerisms. Certain certain things will trigger somebody faster than others. Like mm -hmm. if I'm trying to give me something to eat and your car is in front of my car, we got a problem. Mm -hmm. Like either you go move it, I'm gonna call somebody to move it. The choice is yours. We gonna go back and forth, and eventually I'm gonna file a complaint before you even get your car moved or whatever. Because I'm, I'm gonna document everything, because mm -hmm. then it's gonna turn into a whole harassment situation. But that's neither here nor there. Don't mind me, but whole whole bunch of legal jargon. All I'm gonna say <laughs> is definitely try to be positive about it. If you see it festering, try to nip it in the bud. We do know that people are stuck in their ways in the workplace, so that is something to be mindful of, uh, and. If you are going to file a complaint, you are going to try to address it. You're going to try to be that person. Make sure you document everything. That's my advice to whoever wants to do what they need to do. And and I would add um, control, which you can control, which is yourself. Mm -hmm. Me personally, I my office stays very like mellow. <laughs> I have the lights off. I have lamps on. I have air going. I have jazz playing. Because as a social worker, your days can be very chaotic. And I can't control what's going on in other people's lives or if they have to contact me. But I can take a moment to get some zen in my office. Or like Lakeisha said, I'm in therapy as well. So I can vent and unpack all of these things with someone so mm -hmm. that I can move on from the situation. And then just do things that are fun outside of work that you can look forward to. Um, so that uh, work doesn't become your life and mm -hmm. every little thing becomes bigger than what it needs to be. Um, thank you ladies for joining us today. I felt like this is a really good conversation. Um, I have been Daisha D. And I've been Jay Stang. Join us every other Friday at noon. And always remember to like, comment, and subscribe.